Good morning. Welcome to First Christian Reformed Church of South Holland. What a joy it is to gather together for worship this morning. Thanks so much for joining us and being here. What a great day to worship our God and to hear from His Word, to rejoice together, to grow together in love, to be built up in our faith. So we uh, indeed counted a great blessing that the Lord has called us together today. Just a couple of announcements before we begin our worship service. The first is that this is our last day of catechism classes, and I believe Mr. Craig Knott is off with his father, uh, who has been struggling with his health recently. So uh, I believe that would mean the middle school catechism won't be meeting today, uh, but it is the last meeting of, uh, of the year. High school class will be meeting. Our choir meets together at 5 p.m. tonight, and then there is youth group after our evening service over at First Reformed Church. Members of the council, please be aware of the, the meeting times for tomorrow, and we look forward to meeting together for that. With that, we are ready to begin our worship service. Oh, I should also mention there in, printed in our bulletin, Ascension Day worship service Thursday, uh, May 30th at 7 p.m. Here, here in our church. With that, we are ready to begin our worship service. As we do each week, let's take a few moments of silent prayer, reflection, asking God to, to prepare our hearts for worship, asking the Lord uh, to bless us as we come before Him and uh, wanting to do it rightly. So let's take a few moments in silent prayer and reflection. I'll bring us together with a prayer of invocation. Let us pray. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You are God most high, most good, infinite, eternal, most holy. You search our hearts and you know the depths of all that lies within us. And Father, for that we know that we must humble ourselves before you. We stand before you as needy people needing your help and your grace, knowing that we can only be found right in your sight because of the work of Jesus Christ. So we gather as people who trust in him, those who believe in him and look to him for the forgiveness of our sins. We ask, Father, that you would refresh us by your grace in these moments, in this hour, that you would build up our faith, that you would sanctify us in truth, that you would speak from your word, we leave all other matters to the side. We focus now on you, the work that you do in us. We focus on each other and how you are drawing us together in grace and love and the fellowship of the Spirit. Bind our hearts together in love as we worship you. Pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit reigns as one God, now and forever. Amen. If you're able, please stand. Call to worship is from Psalm 146 this morning. Psalm 146, a responsive reading. We'll respond together. And praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortal men who cannot save. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God. He gives food to the hungry. He sets the prisoners free. He gives sight to the blind. The Lord reigns forever. Praise the Lord. Let's respond together by singing number 301 in our blue hymnal. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah. Remain standing, sing all four verses.
People of God, congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of the heavens and the earth. He greets us with his grace and he calls us his own. Receive the Lord's greeting. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. If you would take your bulletin, we have a confession of faith this morning. Taken from Philippians chapter 2, as we remember the humility of our Lord Jesus Christ and the glory that followed him upon his resurrection and exaltation. Christians, what do we believe concerning our Lord Jesus Christ? Though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Please be seated. To fear the Lord, to have the, the fear of the Lord and to honor Him, uh, to live for Him, is to heed His words and uh, to make sure that when we read His word, it doesn't just stay in our ears or merely in our heads, but that our lives change because of it. It changes our action, and that surely is, is the call upon us as we read the Word of God and as He reminds us that He is our Creator, He is sovereign over all of life, and He calls His creatures uh, to turn to Him, to look to Him, and to heed His Word. Proverbs chapter 1 reminds us of this. What does the wise person do? The wise person hears God speak and acts because of it. Proverbs 1, verse 23, the Lord says, If you turn at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you. And then later on in chapter 1, it goes on to describe those who do not listen to the word of God. And says in verse 29, Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord and would have none of my counsel and despised all my reproof, Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their way and have their fill of their own devices. For the simple are killed by their turning away, and the complacency of fools destroys them. But whoever listens to me will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread of disaster. That should be the aim of our hearts, to listen to God, uh, that our hearts, our souls might dwell secure with him. And we come to a time of uh, refreshing our souls, looking to the Lord, and in doing so and thinking along all of these things, we remind ourselves just with one more passage from Proverbs chapter 3. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Be not wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord, and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones, to love yourself. The love of self is nothing but hatred of self in the end, for it is not the proper thing for us to do. We put the Lord first. We heed his words. We lean not on our own understanding. We trust in his ability to make our paths straight. He says, come to me, acknowledge your sin, repent, refresh yourselves at the waters of grace, follow me, listen to me. These things will bring healing and refreshment to the weary pilgrim. If you boast in anything, let your boast be in Jesus Christ. Don't boast in any gifts, no powers, no earthly wisdom. 
boast in Christ and his work for us. Let's refresh ourselves by the waters of grace uh, this morning. Let's turn in our songbooks to number seven. As we remember the work of our Savior, which becomes the foundation of our boasting, boasting in him, trusting in him before a holy God, Christ who washes us clean of all the sins that we have. Let us sing the song together. Remain seated, sing all the verses, how deep the Father's love for us. Brothers and sisters, lift up your heart to this truth, the proclamation of the gospel of grace proclaimed to us with authority from God's word. The Apostle Peter says that he bore our sins in his body on the tree, the righteous for the unrighteous. In Ephesians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul, under the Spirit's inspiration, says, For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. This is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God not by works, so that no one can boast. By grace you're saved. By Christ you are saved. Look to Him. Trust in Him. Believe in Him and His work. And if you do, there is salvation full and free in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What a great and glorious message, gospel, good news. Trust in Christ and believe in Him. Amen. Let's spend some time together in prayer. together sing the glories of our salvation one for us once again number 14 in our song books the power of the cross stand together sing all the verses
have two scripture readings before our sermon this morning. First is Psalm 67. I encourage you to be in prayer for all of our folks who, who need it and who are sick. And just uh, spoke with John Vandermeer before the service. And they're going to push to try to have Sandy on another kind of, of chemo this week. Um, figuring that with her uh, lack of improvement, that they're really, they feel the need to, to really push towards uh, more aggressive treatment of it. Uh, so be in prayer for them. It's good to see Cal Coster back this morning. Give thanks for that. Of course, many other things going on. We've been praying for Vi Newtbar on the prayer line and the, the new chemo treatments that she'll be undergoing. And then beyond that, there's so many people who deal with things from day to day and, um, and who, who need and covet our prayers. It's good to see uh, Glenn and Char here this morning, but I saw they had to step out just recently, and that's been uh, obviously heavy on, on his heart, so pray for him. And uh, many of us have family members uh, who struggle daily. Many go and sit by bedsides every day, even after long drives, and um, continue to minister to those who need it. Uh, pray for each other and that the Lord would somehow sanctify us through all of these things. So think of those who may have family members outside of our church family, Craig Knott, who's with his father and who really took a turn for the worse this week. You think of Hank and Judy with Scott and lifting up them in prayer. And, um, our, my father-in-law, Michelle's dad, had a heart attack this week, and so we've been lifting him up in prayer. There's so many things, and you, you say, wow, Lord, what are you doing? And, um, you know, it's important to keep in mind that he has a, a greater, grander purpose in all of these things. Spiritually, he's doing something to each of us in all of these things. It's important to keep that in mind. When something comes into our lives, a sickness or a challenge or a trial, that uh, the Lord has some greater purpose for it. I was reading a Puritan this week who was saying that because of that, all the things through which we go in this world are ultimately good. Even those things which are unthinkable evils, if it serves the greater good of the glory of God and the good of his people... There is good in it, and uh, so keep that in mind as you pray for one another, and just wanted to mention some of those things and, and challenge us with that. Anyways, Psalm 67. This is a great uh, Old Testament blessing psalm, and, um, and uh, a great reminder to us of to how God's Word from Old Testament to New speaks of these things, God's grace and His peace. So Psalm 67, let us hear from God's holy word. May God be gracious to us and bless us, and make his face to shine upon us, that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all the nations. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the peoples justly and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. Then the land will yield its harvest, and God, our God, will bless us. God will bless us, and all the ends of the earth will fear him. Amen. And then if you would turn over to Philippians chapter 1. We have a New Testament blessing and greeting at the beginning of the book of Philippians. first two verses. We'll begin a study in the book of Philippians over the next few months. Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. The grass withers, the flower fades, the word of the Lord endures forever. Amen.
All happy families resemble one another. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. This is the opening line, famous opening line, infamous opening line perhaps, of the great Russian novel Anna Karenina. People have wondered for a long, long time, what does this mean? All happy families resemble one another. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Tolstoy is introducing us to the the framework from which he's going to tell his entire story. The framework from which he's going to write this entire novel. This is not a short novel. It's not a very exciting novel. It's not going to bring the reader to the edge of her seat by any means. Normal life, normal challenges, family strife, and trials But once the entire novel is read and significant reflection is given to it, uh, the the, the reader is able to see that it's really a very long way to to illumine the meaning of this opening line. He introduces us into that frame of thinking even from the beginning. And it's not a piece of family improvement advice. It's not as if to say, if you want to be a happy family, there's this, this checklist that you have to follow. It's that... Happy families have no history, and unhappy families are unhappy because of the history they have to tell, and the history that they have to tell is different in every situation. All loving families must endure the challenges in this difficult world that in some sense makes their history unhappy. But the point is that a great author knows what he's doing from start to finish. Charles Dickens, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. There's something about the opening passage of great books that illumines the meaning of the entire book. Whether you're talking about a novel or a letter, a great author knows what he is doing, and particularly an author like Paul, writing under the inspiration of the Spirit and writing for the end of spiritual transformation and faithful living in his audience, he knows what he is doing from the start, and he's going to set the course for us from the start. So the course for Philippians is clearly laid out for us in these couple short verses. There's a triple repetition of the name of Christ Jesus or Jesus Christ, and it lets us know that in Paul's universe, it has Christ at the center. Christ is at the center of Paul's universe, and he shows us true joy, he shows us true holiness, and he shows us a life well lived. True joy, true holiness, and a life well lived. So here's our life transforming reality. True joy is found by serving Christ, by being his willing slave. True holiness is established by existing in Christ. And a life well lived is one centered upon and modeled after Jesus Christ. A life well lived is one centered upon and modeled after Jesus Christ. All of this happens when we have Christ at the center of our lives, the Christ, Christ at the center of our worldview, and we become captivated by him, captivated by him, captivated to be made captive of something, a willing servant of Jesus Christ. First, a quick introduction to the book of Philippians. This is a heartfelt letter that Paul writes to the church in Philippi. Some people look at the language of this letter and the terms of affection and and joy that Paul has in this letter, and they think that this is sort of his his favorite congregation. These are his most favored of his spiritual children. Now, of course, a, a good spiritual father, like a good earthly father, isn't going to play favorites in that kind of way, but it's very affectionate towards the church in Philippi. And he writes this letter on the occasion of his receiving a generous gift from them so that his ministry might continue. Just like now, just like today, we take gifts for our missionaries. We send them money so that their work might continue. Paul received this likely while he was in Rome, likely under house arrest, and so he writes this with a lot of time to reflect upon things, and that's why the letters like Philippians and Colossians and Ephesians and Philemon all have a very rich theological meat to them because Paul was under house arrest, imprisoned the time that he wrote it. A couple of of themes in the book of Philippians. First is the theme of joy. 
the theme of joy. Paul is going to exemplify what it means to have joy in Christ. He's going to call the Philippians to have true joy in Christ. But he does that through another theme, perhaps a theme that is even more prevalent around the the, the verb group to think or to consider. Paul says that a lot in Philippians. Consider this about yourselves. Consider this about Jesus Christ. If you have this frame of mind, this frame of thinking, then your life will be transformed to true joy found in Christ. The history of the church of Philippians begins in Acts chapter 16. A bit of an interesting beginning. There was no synagogue there, so uh, Paul was called in a vision to go to Macedonia and preach the gospel. Philippi was the first city he settled in to preach the gospel. There was no synagogue, so there's no place for him to go and open up the the Old Testament scriptures on a Sabbath day. So they actually go to a a prayer group, literally a prayer meeting outside the gates of the city on a Saturday and meet a bunch of God-fearers who fear the God of Israel. Amongst them is Lydia. Lydia was a woman of some wealth and some significance. She is converted to Christ. She is baptized along with her household, and her house becomes the central meeting hub of the Philippian church. Paul and Silas are walking through the marketplace and there's a slave girl who has been prophesying because she's possessed by an evil spirit and her owners have profited off of her work. She follows Paul around and she starts screaming about him and at him that he is proclaiming the truth of the the one true God. In a sense there, she's of course speaking what is true, but Paul rebukes her and rebukes the spirit that is inside of her casts the demon out and this makes her owners very angry and they say Paul and and Silas need to be thrown in prison they need to be beaten because of what they've done because they're no longer going to profit off of this slave girl who had been prophesying that sets up one of the most famous accounts in the New Testament church where Paul and Silas are in the Philippian jail and in the middle of the night there's an earthquake and their chains fall off and the doors swing open the jailer wakes up and realizes that his job, he probably loses his job, he probably loses his life, and so he goes to fall on his sword. Paul calls out to him, we're still here. He is converted to Christ. He and his household are baptized. So you can imagine these kinds of unlikely converts, Lydia, perhaps even the slave girl, the Philippian jailer, 15 years later receiving this letter, being part of a fledgling church in the Macedonian world. Philippi, the church of the Philippians, shows us how the early church advances through gospel proclamation, shows us how the apostles give up their own well-being in order to advance the gospel message. It shows us how unlikely converts come to the church, and, and it shows us how the church, even though it is not explicitly subversive, it's not trying to take over the Roman Empire, there are ways in which it's perceived as subversive because of reasons like the slave girl whose demon was cast out of her. Paul is thrown into prison because of that. He's treated shamefully, as he will say later. Because Christians, when they, they, they come to Christ as the gospel advances, their life completely changes. They cannot bow the knee to any earthly leader. They cannot have a, a kind of fusion of pagan religions. It becomes all about the Lord Jesus Christ. And He is the King of kings on the throne of thrones and on the throne of their hearts. And so it shows us the kind of peculiar existence that New Testament believers have. Paul reinforces this by saying in chapter 3, our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior. Speaking to many people who were Roman citizens, he says our citizenship is in heaven. First then, Paul talks about true joy being found in Christ. True joy being found in Christ. There's one other thing uh, that you need to understand about the city of Philippi, and that's It was a Roman colony. Roman colony. It was named Philippi after King Philip, the father of Alexander the Great. It was conquered by the Roman Empire. It became a Roman colony. So it became, in a sense, a a hub of Roman life. It was a, a Rome away from home. There would be many public officials and military officers who retired there. And you would have the same privileges if you lived there as if you lived in Rome, in the capital city. When you uh, take that and you you realize a couple things, particularly about Greco-Roman culture, number one, there was a culture of slavery, a huge 
chunk of the population would be slaves. And then secondly, it was an honor and shame culture. You realize that in a city that was a Roman colony, what was at the center of the, the, the mind of most Philippians was advancing in status. Advancing in status and gaining titles and recognition. It would be like living in Hollywood or Washington, D.C. If you live in Hollywood, you run into a lot of people who want to be the next big thing. Their life dream is to be a big actor, to be famous because of it, and to enjoy riches through that. If you live in Washington, D.C., there's going to be tons of people walking around who are trying to uh, go up the, the ladder of political influence, thinking about themselves, perhaps they'll be in the House of Representatives one day, and to the Senate, and perhaps even run for President of the United States, or the many staffers who work around these politicians. It's a rat race of these kinds of things. Philippi was a rat race of status. Archaeological digs have shown that they were obsessed with resumes. They would inscribe the, their titles and their various achievements so that they could show to others. This would have created a, a, a kind of culture where the people around you, especially those in power, can be leveraged for your own advancement so that you can enjoy the kinds of blessing that status brings to you. We understand that and we see the way that Paul wants to address the kind of mindset that would have been in Philippi and he does it very clearly at the beginning of this letter. He says, Paul and Timothy, slaves of Jesus Christ, slaves of Christ Jesus. The word there is doulos. Really, it's better translated slaves than servants because there was no choice, no personal choice most of the time involved with being a servant or a slave would have been embedded in their way of life. And Paul wants to address the kind of mindset that is present in the Philippians by calling himself a servant of Jesus Christ. He's going to talk this way throughout the letter. We read it this morning in our reading of the law. Later on in the letter of Philippians, he's going to say, do nothing from rivalry or conceit. In other words, don't look at the people around you as your rivals. Don't look at them as if you need to get ahead of them. A couple of weeks ago, I was speaking with a close friend of mine who works at a very competitive tax law firm. He says, it's a rat race. Everybody wants a promotion so that someday they can work less, right? You work like a dog for 10 years so that someday you can have a manager position and work less. In order to get to that status, what do you need? You need billable hours. So you need to start working at 6 a.m. You need to stop working at 8 p.m., and at the end of the year, hopefully, you've outperformed all of the rivals around you so that you can be promoted. And you're one step closer to enjoying that position you've always wanted. It is a rat race. The church is to be nothing like that, Paul says. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit. In humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look out not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. See, that passage comes alive a little bit when you start to imagine the context of Philippi. When the entire city, the entire culture would have been caught up in this rat race of status and wanting to advance their own name. So Paul addresses this by saying he's a slave of Jesus Christ. The slave was the one person whose entire existence would, have lie, would lie outside the race course in this status rat race. They would have been like the pit crew to allow the driver, the race car driver, to get all of the glory. It would have been like uh, the makeup crew backstage that you never see and you never hear from so that the actors on stage can receive all the accolades and all the glory. These are the ones, slaves, who put their personal ambitions to the side to, to advance the cause of their master. One of my seminary professors wrote a, uh, a commentary on Philippians and he says there's a lot of evidence that slaves were talked of in that day as merely thinking tools, right? They're kind of like a shovel that thinks and talks. Reminds me of growing up when I kind of felt like a talking lawnmower, a lawnmower who could think and who could talk. But it seemed that the only reason I was put on this earth was to make long grass short. Paul is wanting to address this deficiency in the mind of his audience by adopting this powerless position. I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. I'm a willing slave of Jesus Christ. But he doesn't call them to that just to call them to that. He has a greater purpose, and here's the key. 
He wants them to see and to realize that true joy, true joy is found in being a slave, a servant of Christ Jesus. This is a truth that goes down to the very foundations of our existence. We were created by God. We were created for God to glorify Him and to serve Him. And unless we are rightly constituted in that order of authority, that hierarchy of God is above me and I serve Him, then we're not living the way that we've been called to live. True joy, Christian joy, is found in selflessly serving King Jesus and others for His sake, as my professor put it. Dennis Johnson, actually, the one who came here and preached at at my installation, wrote this commentary on Philippians. And he says, true Christian joy is found in selflessly serving King Jesus and others for his sake. So in order to call them to this kind of mindset, Paul starts right at the beginning. And he does it by saying slaves. He also does it by naming Timothy alongside of him. But then notice that he doesn't call himself apostle of Jesus Christ. He doesn't say slave of Jesus Christ and apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, this is the only place in the New Testament where Paul says he's a servant of Jesus Christ, but doesn't say that he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. He's not renouncing his apostleship by doing that. But think about the way that a Philippian person would see Paul. Because they were a culture obsessed with title and status, they would have already known that he's an apostle. They would have seen him first and foremost as having that title of authority. So what Paul is doing is he's showing them the kind of servant heart that an apostle of Jesus Christ has to have because he serves Christ first. Imagine that there's a young man, 9, 10, 11 years old, who loves politics and he wins some contest in order to shadow the governor of his state for the day. So he goes to the state capitol, but within a few minutes, the governor, who's a wise governor, so you're really going to have to imagine here in this situation, he, he's a wise governor, and he begins to see that something is amiss. And uh, he sees that this, this young man, the reason he loves politics is because uh, he wants to be in public office someday because he wants to really feel like he's in charge. He wants to be able to tell people what to do. And so one of his first questions to the governor is, what do you do every day to really be able to to lean into your power, to be able to show people that you're the one in charge? And the governor, being wise, gets up and he goes and gets a, a tray of coffee mugs and he brings coffee to everyone in his office. He uses that opportunity to show this young man that there's a lot that he needs to learn about leadership. In a similar way, Paul says, I'm a slave of Christ Jesus. He doesn't say he's an apostle because he knows that the minds of the Philippians, they're already thinking about him that way and perhaps regarding it in the wrong kind of way. So he teaches them a lesson about what it means to lead. He also does this interesting thing, the only letter in the New Testament where he explicitly names in the greeting the elders and the deacons, the overseers and the deacons. There's a dual aspect to this. The first thing is that he wants to call something to mind in the elders and deacons themselves. He's saying, you who have been called to this authoritative position of leadership in the church, don't you forget the kind of leader you are to be. You are to model your leadership after me, and I model my leadership after Christ Jesus. I'm a slave, a willing slave of him. I am his willing servant. But he's also reminding the entire church that, number one, the elders and deacons have legitimate authority and leadership in the church, and they don't exist for you to leverage yourself uh, up the social ladder of the church. Don't consider them as rivals or don't consider them as existing for your own personal advancement. Paul does, in all of these things, he says, I'm a slave of Christ Jesus, to begin to call them to willing service of Christ and loving service of others. True joy is found in serving Christ. Secondly, true holiness is found by existing in Christ. True holiness is found by existing in Christ. Paul says to all of the saints in Christ Jesus. This is a word that is derived from the word holy. It's just holy ones. Hagios is the word for holy. Hagioi, to you holy ones in Christ. 
Christ Jesus. The idea of holiness is one, especially as we lead up to Christ, there's a lot of tension around the idea of holiness. It's that which God called, called his people to be and that which they are not. He calls them to be holy and at the root of it, they are not in and of themselves holy. And this is one of the great tensions of temple worship. The Day of Atonement, the holy place, the most holy place, all of these provisions need to, needed to be made because you had men who themselves were flawed and sinful approaching the presence of God who is nothing but holiness and righteousness and majesty and power. So you think of the, the high priest on the Day of Atonement goes into the most holy place. He tied a rope around himself in case he died while he was in there so that they could pull him out. What is a holy person? A holy person is someone set apart by God and granted access into his presence, enabled to stand before him. There is a tension in Old Testament temple worship in all of these ways. Why? Because at the root of it, temple worship, as we read in the book of Hebrews, was not able to cleanse the conscience of the people of Israel. They knew that there would have to be another sacrifice and another, and another. One of the greatest pictures of this is Zechariah chapter 3, where the prophet there has this vision of a high priest standing in heaven. We read in verse 3, Now Joshua was standing before the angel clothed with filthy garments, representing human sin. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, Behold, I have taken away your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. This vision pictures for us that central truth that we just finished in Luke, one that Paul proclaimed all throughout the world, the hope of the gospel. And it is this, that the message of Scripture is that holiness is not something earned by us. It's something granted to us by the holy God himself. The prophet Isaiah pictures this in chapter 61. He says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord, and my soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. The hope of the gospel is that God covers us with the robe of righteousness. He removes our filthy garments. He is the true and better Joshua. Joshua in the Old Testament, Yeshua, that is the name that Jesus had. He is the new, the better, the ultimate Joshua, the one who fulfills this vision of Zechariah for us, that he himself takes on our filthy garments that he might clothe us in the robes of his righteousness. And that's why Paul says, you are saints in Christ Jesus. The idea of being in Christ is going to be central to his thought in this letter. He's going to say rejoice in Christ Jesus. He's going to say be encouraged in Christ Jesus. He's going to say you, do not, you need not have anxiety or worry or fear in Christ Jesus. But that is all rooted in the core message of salvation. Where in chapter 3, Paul picturing and imagining the kind of life, the kind of world that all the Philippians are living in the rat race of status and the obsession with their resume and all of their achievements. And he says this, whatever, he recounts his own resume and then he says this, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found where? In him be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law in other words not having a holiness that I have myself achieved but the righteousness that comes through faith in Christ true holiness is found by existing in Christ and being in him as we trust in his work for us, to be holy, to be set apart by God and enabled to stand before Him, granted access into His presence, that happens for those who are in Christ. And not just for the priests and the rabbis and the Pharisees, it's for the Philippian jailers, it's for the God fearers, it's for those who meet outside the gate, it's perhaps even for slave girls who have been possessed 
by an evil spirit. Paul says to all of the saints in Christ Jesus, for we are all dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. Finally, then, Paul teaches them that a life well lived is one centered on and modeled after Christ. A one centered on and modeled after Christ. He says grace and peace. Grace and peace because he knows that he wants to to show them that it's only by the grace of God that he can pronounce a blessing upon them. He wants grace to be at the center of their life, at the center of their minds. It's to grip them as they consider their life before God. The concept of grace, the concept of unmerited favor or demerited favor that God gives you the very opposite of what you deserve because of the work of his son. He made him who he made him who knew no sin to become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. See what love Uh, See what manner of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God. Grace, covenantal blessing. And then another covenantal blessing, peace. Grace and peace. May God make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace. There's a lot of Old Testament threads that this connects to. And the idea is that the, the Jewish idea of shalom, Many people talk about shalom today and they think about it in more of an earthbound way, that which creates the kind of common peace that we experience in in, in the common grace world. Paul here shows us that true biblical shalom is fulfilled in the peace that is granted to us as we are reconciled to God by His grace. Those who know God's grace are those who know God's peace, and those who know God's peace are the ones who show that peace to those around them, to those who are in Christ, and who seek ways to show forth that love and grace and peace to a world that needs to be saved from their sin. Reconciliation that comes by grace grants peace. And that reconciliation creates peace amongst God's people. So Paul shows us the necessity of being centered upon Christ and indeed captivated by Christ. He repeats the name of Christ three times. Slaves of Christ Jesus, saints in Christ Jesus, grace and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's heart for the people is that they would be completely centered upon the Lord to know the gospel, to live out of the gospel, to rejoice in the hope of it, and to live according to the call of it. Rejoice in the hope of the gospel, live according to the call of the gospel. Peace uh, with God flows into peace with one another and not doing anything from rivalry or conceit. To be captivated by Christ, to become captive to something, We become so centered upon Christ that it is our joy to serve him, to be like Paul, to become a willing slave of Jesus Christ, joyful servants of the king. Why? It's all centered around really the the, the pinnacle of the book of Philippians, and we said it today in our affirmation of faith, because our king humbled himself, because our king became a servant for us. Consider yourselves this way, Paul says. Consider yourselves the way Christ did for himself. Though he was in the form of God, he did not consider it something to be zealously clung to, equality with God, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. Taking the form of a slave, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus Christ every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. True joy is found in serving this king, in becoming his willing servant, his willing slave. True holiness is found by existing in this king. And a life well lived is found in being centered upon and modeling it after the humility and the service, the willing service of our King Jesus Christ as we trust in the robes of his righteousness granted to us by faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, 
Your Son, Jesus Christ, is the foundation of the church. We, we make no other boast. We trust in Him alone. And we pray that by Your grace, You would create in us a willingness to serve Him and to serve others. Father, we renounce the, the rat race of riches or status. We consider each other not rivals. But Father, we know that You call us to, to love each other and serve one another modeled after Christ. Bless the reading and the preaching of your word by your spirit. Bring it to life for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll stand together and sing verses 1, 2, 5, and 6. 1, 2, 5, and 6 of number 347. The church is one foundation. 347 in the red, verses 1, 2, 5, and 6. Go in his grace, receive God's benediction. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.